Hey, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to your Thanato chemistry class. I'm going to be your professor. My name is Joe Finicaro. And you are here to study the chemistry of death or Thanato chemistry. So without any further delays, let's get right into it. Few people in our society are dependent only on themselves. And that means that they are capable of making their own food, doing their own shelter, making their own clothing. They need nothing from anybody else. And generally, when we think of such individuals, it is in a negative connotation. They're living in the middle of the woods in some compound somewhere. They got a lot of guns. Hell yeah. Woo okay, so it's just one of those things that, for the most part, we are dependent on society. We're dependent on tools, machinery, sources of energy. You know, if we need something, run down to Harbor Freight or Home Depot or Lowe's and buy the tool that we need. We're not going out and chiseling out some stones and trying to use it as a screwdriver. Uh, same thing goes with electricity. Many of us do not have a windmill or solar generator on our homes or in our yards. In fact, governments in here in Miami has done a pretty good job of trying to prevent you from putting windmills up. Um, we instead have to use public utilities or privatized utilities for public use that um, generate electricity off of hydroelectric or nuclear reaction. To study science is to enlarge one's perspective on the world and to begin to understand the present day world. Chemistry is the science of substances. It's devoted to increasing our understanding of the universe in the sense of what it is made of, how it is organized and structured, and how it works. In order to understand what we're talking about, scientists develop approximations. They create models and theories of great imagination and power. Think about those of you that have taken um, your introduction to funeral service or history of funeral service course, or you've read the um, appendices of embalming history in the uh, fifth edition of Robert G. Mayer's Embalming History Theory and Practice book, and it talks about early uh, anatomists like Galen. They had no idea how the body actually functioned. They weren't able to actually study human bodies. So they made approximations and created theories based off of animal cadaver observation. Obviously, it's not completely accurate because the way we do things physiologically can be a little bit different depending on the animal that we're studying. And obviously, if you're studying many different types of animals, there are subtle differences between them as well. But at least they had a you know, close approximation. The cornerstones of the science of chemistry are among the most outstanding intellectual achievements in science. Chemistry, by definition, is the study of matter. It is subdivided into two broad fields, organic and inorganic chemistry. Organic chemistry is concerned exclusively with the chemistry of the element carbon and all of its compounds, while inorganic chemistry is devoted to the chemistry of all other elements. So as you can imagine, Carbon is fairly important. Additionally, there are specialized areas of organic and inorganic chemistry, which usually include other fields of science. So biochemistry, or biological chemistry, the study of chemistry and chemical processes of living, or living organisms, not just human beings, but anything, microbes, viri, um, how they interact, how they do things. And someone out there is losing their mind right now, well, technically a virus isn't living. And certainly a uh, prion isn't living, but how they interact with the chemical processes of living organisms would certainly be something that falls into biochemistry. And this can then be broken down into bioorganic as well as bioinorganic chemistry. Analytical chemistry. Analytical chemistry is concerned with the qualitative and quantitative aspects of chemistry. Two important words there. Qualitative analysis seeks to answer the question, uh, dude, what is it? While quantitative attempts to answer the question, how much is there? So a qualitative analysis would be, dude, did you pick up the Paps Blue Ribbon? Or, dude, did you get some Heineken? And then the second more important question is, dude, how much of the brew did you buy? Physical chemistry is the study of the physical nature of matter, including the fundamental laws and theories of chemistry as they relate to the types of bonds that occur in the chemical structure and composition of substances. Radiochemistry, or radiation chemistry, is the study of the chemistry of radioactive matter, nuclear reactions, and atomic structure. And then, embalming chemistry. 
the study of the chemical processes involving dead organic matter in terms of the decomposition and preservation. And, bada bing, this is the one that's most important to us when we are studying the course that we're in, the natochemistry. Matter, many of us are familiar with the general definition of matter from high school, from intro to chemistry courses, whatever, anything that occupies space and has mass. Well, one more thrown thing in here, possesses inertia. Anything that has mass possesses inertia and occupies space. All things that we see or feel or in any way recognized by our senses can generally be defined as matter. Inertia is a property of matter by which it, um, matter continues in its existing state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line unless that state is changed by an external force. So in this case, um, we have a rather large piece of looks like granite well, it doesn't look like concrete, but some type of natural rock that was put into a shipping container. And Dum Dums put the doors on the wrong side. So when he came to a screeching halt for whatever reasons, um, the stored energy of the solid object, the granite, came, slid, now turned into kinetic energy, hit the doors, and turned the semi into a compact. Obviously, this could have killed someone. The first law of motion, Newton's first law of motion, states that matter has the ability to remain at rest until some outside force acts upon it to set it in motion. So in this case, we have Mr. Muggles eating his dinner. We introduce a new item to the environment called a cucumber, and some outside force acted upon Mr. Muggles, and Mr. Muggles is not a happy kitty. No, it's not my cat. Don't worry about it. Once in motion... Matter has the ability to stay in motion following a straight path and with a constant momentum until another external force acts upon it. And some of you who are trying to call the prof out, well, how come things just slow down? There's nothing in the way. Nah. Well, that's because there is a such thing as the liquid of air. And air has thickness. It has a viscosity. And air friction will cause something to slow, however minutely, until it comes to a stop. Um... The result of the action of the second force may be to accelerate the momentum, something basically gets behind and pushes it, to slow it down, gets ahead of it and tries to slow it, such as uh, friction, or even to deflect the moving matter to another path or bring it to rest. And when we study ballistics, um, uh, in pathology we talk about uh, projectiles such as bullets. You know, deflection of projectiles can lead to some very unfortunate events in your professional funeral services careers. Uh, so in the case of uh, hand we have here in the picture, inertia, you have some guy driving his, um, his motorcycle. He decides that the best course of action will be to drive at a very high speed into a wall of tires because that's what people in motorcycles on racetracks apparently do. They're not supposed to. Uh, and what happens is the tires act immediately upon the motorcycle. And you can see that's pretty well stopped. I mean, it's going to go through it. Don't take me wrong. This is like in action. However, the kinetic energy, the stored energy in the human, since there's nothing anchoring him to the motorcycle, launches him clean off the top. And he's going to remain in motion uh, until gravity, air, and in this case, the ground act upon him. And eventually he'll come to a stop as he goes splat. Force can be defined as the cause of motion in matter or the cause of change in or cessation of motion. Acceleration is defined as the rate by which the velocity of an object in motion changes with time. Mass is defined as the measure of the inertia of matter. And here we have everyone's favorite little fuzzy football. The larger the mass of an object, the greater force is necessary to set it in motion or to slow, deflect, or bring it to rest again. The bigger it is, the harder it is to get going or to stop. Unless it's this guy and you drop a cucumber behind him, and we'll find that he's probably a very agile individual. In our everyday usage, we use the concept of weight to describe mass, but by some definitions, and in actuality, they are different things. The reason for this is because all the matter that we're dealing with is earthbound. The concept of weight is developed by mass being acted upon by the gravitational attraction of another mass of matter. That's cute. 
what it basically says is weight is subjective. Okay? Weight is subjective. The amount of something, its mass, does not change. One kilogram of weight is one kilogram of weight. But if you go to the moon, one kilogram of weight of the weight is going to weigh less because the gravity is different. The attraction which makes mass equivalent to its weight is the gravitational attraction of the Earth on everything that exists on or near the surface. There are numerous ways to take a measurement of length. There's a stand we use in the United States and the rest of the world. If you're wondering why that came about, well, when we decided that we wanted to be our own country, we decided to go against the grain. True story. Many people approximate a yard as the distance between their left ear and the tip of their extended right hand, or mark off three footsteps. Well, not too precise. In the United States, the length of things are usually measured in terms of inches, feet, yards, and miles. And then the rest of the world looks at us pretty funny and says, no, we just use the metric system. Much easier that way. And the metric system is set up using factors of 10. It is the standard typically used in science when your distances are measured in terms of divisions or multiples of a meter. Meter is defined as that, the distance from the North Pole to the equator of the Earth. Now, there's a bunch of numbers in here. I'm just not going to go ahead and read them off to show that I can. It's just memorize the number. Okay? You're not going to be audibly asked what something is, so you might as well just write it all down. And yes, there's a lot of zeros. There's a lot of decimals coming up. No card it. Beat it into your head. Uh, the length was standardized by a meter stick made of an alloy of platinum and iridium kept at a constant temperature in the Bureau of Weights and Measures that is located near Paris, France. Well, because of social and political concerns, i.e., can't get out of the country to go measure the meter stick, uh, people may actually be prevented from getting there to actually make sure that their meter rod is exactly a meter. So everyone pulled their collective thoughts together to form some new standards. So the System International, okay, or the International System of Units, SI, Define the meter as, oh my God, the length of what the hell ever times the wavelength of the orange red line and the spectrum of the isotope of the element Krypton. Well, apparently they can't afford the $1,500 flight to get their butts to Paris to measure it, but you can afford, like, you know, a several thousand dollar spectroscope and get your hand in some pure Krypton. So you figure it out. But this way, basically, no matter where you are, if you have a spectroscope, you have this isotope, you can actually derive the correct measurement. A further redefinition by the General Conference on Weights and Measures states that a meter is the distance light travels in a vacuum in another ridiculous number in a second. Write all these down. Make sure you know who they referred to. Every one of these is a valid test question. And this is A, B, C, D, man. This is black and white. You be, better be able to answer a question like this. This is the gimme points, okay? The system international in the metric system has base units for each type of measurement and prefixes that either multiply or divide the unit into multiples of 10. Length, the general one, is meter, small m. Mass. Kilogram, heat, calorie, small c. We'll see. We'll talk about the big c shortly. In addition, there are two further measurements. Volume, which is liter, and it can also be spelled by some individuals L-I-T-R-E. Both are correct. Um, both are co correct spellings of it. And temperature, in this case, degrees Celsius. Um, someone right now is losing their mind. Oh my God, you know, scientists don't really use Celsius. We have the absolute scale, the Kelvin scale. You're totally wrong. The book is completely crap. Nyeh. Take a deep breath. Get Zen. It's all good. Okay? Other measurements of temperature can be used um, in our degrees. Our Fahrenheit is degree Fahrenheit, which is common in the U.S. Not too many other places, but common in the U.S. And Kelvin, which is pretty much the common one used in, in the scientific community, yes. Um, the liter is not actually a basic unit of SI, but it's derived from the linear measurement, and degree Celsius is not an SI unit either, 
but it's based off of the Kelvin. It's not too much harder to figure that one out in comparison to Kelvin, so we're just going to use that because numbers are smaller. So now we have the prefixes, okay? Giga, mega, kilo, et cetera. You are going to be responsible for the prefixes, their exponentials, their actual number, and their abbreviations. So if I asked you, you know, what is the term giga means, whatever, I could either go with the actual number, okay? I could go with the exponential, or I could go with the abbreviation. I would expect you to know that. The conversion factors for linear measurements are here. One meter, one inch, one mile, one cubic centimeter. Okay? Um, these are important. Okay? These are important. Because especially when you get into something like restorative art, you may be asked to do a conversion from inches to centimeters or meters to inches. Now, the one good thing about this is that if you have the base done, okay, you know that 2.54 centimeters is one inch, then you can pretty much figure out anything going forward because inches make up feet and uh, centimeters can be divided down to millimeters or kilometers or meters or whatever you need to do. Most of us, when it comes to volume, are accustomed, accustomed by the use of gallons, quarts, and pints. Uh, it's an interesting thing that if you listen to any American chef, you watch any American cooking channel, you will hear them refer to cups, tablespoons, etc., 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 etc. And these are approximations. If obviously you take a cup of brown sugar, those of you who have spent any time in the kitchen making something other than ramen noodles, and you fill a cup with brown sugar, recipe calls for a cup of brown sugar. Many of you who bake will know, well, there's a problem here. Because if I do a pressed brown sugar, one that's going to affect the recipe, but you're going to have more in a cup if you tamp it down and top it off than if you just scoop in and run your finger across the top. So if you watch something like the Sorted Food Channel, where they're from Great Britain, they talk about food, food by its weight in grams. And it's much more precise. In the metric system, volumes such as liters, milliliters, cubic centimeters, grams, etc., a uh, liter is slightly larger than a United States quart. And there is the conversion factors. And these are hugely important because we're going to be doing a lot of ounce conversions, uh, potentially in embalming. We're going to be asked, you know, how many ounces is this? How many milliliters would it be, et cetera? Um, the actual is 29.57 rounded, that's why I see the tilde, to 30. The milliliters, or cubic centimeters, I'm sorry. Um, no, there, there's a typo in the next in one of these other conversions. We'll get there. Measurement of mass or weight. Mass is a measurement of the amount of matter contained in an object where weight is the measure of the gravitational pull. So we see that um, in their purest definitions, there is a subtle difference. Mass is how much is it. And then the weight, the subjective, is how much does it actually weigh as a result of gravity. Mass will always remain constant, whether it's on the Earth's surface or space. A kilogram is a kilogram, but the weight may vary. We've beaten this, and I have beaten this into your head by now, so I'm not going to go nuts with it. Now that we've beaten it into you, for the most part, we will use terms like weight and mass interchangeably going forward, because none of us are going to be, you know, computing embalming weights for embalming on the International Space Station. Now, if you do get to do that, pictures on social media, it did not happen. In the United States, we use um, the terms that we use are tons, pounds, and ounces. The metric system uses the measure of a kilogram, which is 1,000 grams. Prefixes are important. Kilo, 1,000 grams. And a gram has been defined as the weight of one cubic centimeter of water, one cc of water, at four degrees Celsius. And here is that aforementioned, hey, what's going on here, rounding problem. So one pound is equal to 
four or five, three point five nine grams, four hundred fifty three point five nine grams, which is approximated as four fifty four. And the twenty eight point three five grams of an ounce is approximated to thirty just for easy computation. Um, thirty is much easier to do math with than twenty nine, for instance. So it's probably why they rounded up. I have verified if you go on and you go in your favorite search engine, it will tell you that it's um, like 30 grams rather than 29. So density. Density refers to the mass of the object or its weight divided by its volume. So mass, how much does it weigh? Density, uh, kind of wrap your mind, how thick is it? Is kind of the best way to kind of verbalize them. Things that have a high weight associated with them tend to be very dense. Your book illustrates equal size blocks of lead versus styrofoam. The blocks are going to be equal size, but they're going to have different weights, okay? Different weights because of their density. A pound of bricks versus a pound of feathers is an inverse correlation. You will have one brick that's a pound and however many feathers it takes to make a pound of feathers. Back in the day, I remember in grammar school, a uh, teacher asked us, you know, what weighs more, uh, 10 pounds of bricks, 10 pounds of feathers? And a bunch of people took the bait and answered, oh, uh, bricks. Hey, take the lollipop out of your mouth and think for a second. 10 pounds is 10 pounds. So there's the density formula uh, put into algebraic, okay? Mass divided by volume equals density. Now, do not confuse density with specific gravity. They're very similar in some ways, okay? Formulas is something divided by something. Specific gravity is defined as the comparison of the weight of an object with the weight of an equal volume of water. It can also be defined as the density of an object divided by the density of water. So water always has the specific gravity of one because any number divided by itself gives you one. If you did not know that, you might want to go back and relook at that math class. Objects that have a specific gravity less than one have a tendency to float. Objects that have a specific gravity greater than one tend to sink. So if it's greater than one, quote unquote, it's going to be heavier than water and it will sink. Well, a ship is made of metal and it floats because it displaces a volume that contains air, which is lighter. So its density is less than that of a block of solid metal. You take a block of solid metal, you throw it in the ocean, you lose said block of metal. Hollow that metal out so that the space inside is filled with something that is not as dense as water, and it may float, depending on how you've done it. And as long as the boat remains upright, its specific gravity is less than that of water, and so it floats. Screw it up in any way, shape, or form. Once the water starts filling where the air is, it's going to sink. Blood, slightly more dense than water, uh, depending on what's in it. And there's the formula. Density of object on top, density of water on the bottom, and then you divide. And that's going to give you whatever you need to get. Thermometers. Temperature is measured by the use of thermometers. Thermometers may be created for specific uses and functions. Uh, a room thermometer that measures room temperature is going to be completely unsuitable for use as a candy thermometer or a meat thermometer used in cooking. Um, you're going to want something much more specific, those of you that play with uh, the hot napalm that is melted sugar. Most United States citizens are familiar with the Fahrenheit scale. The metric or SI system measures temperatures using Celsius or Kelvin, okay, or absolute scales. No matter which thermometer system we use, all are based on the freezing and boiling points of water. And like a ruler, a thermometer differs only in the measurement being used, whether it actually reads in Fahrenheit or in Celsius, because you don't really run out to your favorite big box store like Kmart, Big Lots, or Walmart and grab something in Kelvin. Uh, if you put the two thermometers side by side, drop them in some water, they're going to mark the level at which it boils, they're going to mark the level at which it freezes, it's going to be the same except for the numbers being used. So there's the basic difference. We see that there's 180 difference in Fahrenheit, bit of a pain in the butt, 
Celsius, it's easy as pie. Zero, it freezes. 100, it boils. And Kelvin is 373, 273. Because absolute zero in Kelvin doesn't just mean frozen. It means absolutely no atomic movement whatsoever. It is so cold that even the atoms do not resonate. There are 180 incremental units between the boiling point of water and the freezing point of water on the Fahrenheit scale, while the Celsius scale only has 100. Uh, at one time, Celsius was called centigrade. And it, I like the way it says that because I still learned centigrade when I was in school in the 80s. Uh, centi meaning 100. Century, centurion, all mean 100. So it gives you the conversion, um, conversion formulas. Yeah, you're probably going to be asked to do some conversion without, okay, without a calculator. So you best be able to, you know, do this on paper, just run some numbers uh, and get used to doing it because you're not permitted a calculator on your board exam. And until that changes, you will not be permitted a calculator on my exams. Talks a little bit more about Kelvin. Um, have fun with that. Big thing here is that when you use Kelvin, we do not use a degree symbol. So if, we're at, if a question is asking you something about, hey, what's this temperature in Kelvin? Just look for a straight number. Just look for a straight number without the degree symbol. Heat. Heat is the energy that causes temperature changes in matter, and heat is measured in calories. A calorie is defined as the amount of heat necessary to raise the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius, and one atmosphere of pressure. We're not going to get into how atmospheres and pressures um, change uh, boiling and freezing things. That's a bit beyond the scope here, but it is important that one gram of water at one atmosphere of pressure, boom. 1,000 calorie is the same as one kilo calorie, okay? In some textbooks, you will see them use, and we'll see in the next slide, I believe it is, um, the large C. There is a difference. I want to say it's the restorative art book or the embalming book. Uh, it talks about calorie versus calorie big C. Big C means 1,000 calories equals kilocalorie. Small C is just one. Um, I know it gets confusing, but just understand there's a difference. If it's one calorie, small c, okay, it is one calorie. So one more time, one calorie equals one calorie. If I change this to this, I am now looking at that. And also... Kilocalorie equals 1,000 as well. So be very, very careful. Read the questions. Take deep breaths when going through these exams so you don't make easy, easy mistakes. For the purposes of this course, um, I may use all three to get you used to be able, able to decipher the data you're being given because you never know how someone is going to ask you a question on your board exam. To determine the number of calories involved in a temperature change, Use the following formula. There it is. Number of grams of water times the change in temperature. Energy. Well, that's defined as the ability or capacity to do work. According to my supervisor, I do not have a lot of energy. When a physical or a chemical change occurs, heat or thermal energy can be either absorbed or released by the system. It either contains it or it puts it out in the environment. So an exo-outside, exothermic reaction releases the heat generated by the system to the environment, to its surroundings. Whereas an endothermic, endo meaning inside, endothermic reactions absorb the heat generated by the um, surroundings into the system itself. It will draw heat in. It will store heat. Like heat, the unit of thermal energy is calorie, okay? Calories are used for energy, whether it be thermal energy, whatever. We will probably almost universally in this course use this as a measure of heat. 
The law of conservation of energy states energy is neither created nor destroyed in a chemical reaction. It must remain net equal. If it does something, it's still going to be the same way on the other side. The energy cannot be destroyed. And the law of conservation of mass says that mass is never created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. So it says here, if you add two different reactants, you're going to get a total amount of product available that comprise both reactants. So 32 plus 56 equals 88 grams. Boom. No matter what happens. Now, the energy may be released into the environment or whatever it might be. It might be stored. So there are two separate reactions going on. Einstein developed a formula which related energy to mass using the speed of light. His conservation of mass and energy implied that the two could be interconverted in nuclear reactions. And we all know about the E equals MC squared conversion. Energy may be categorized as of two general types, kinetic or potential. Kinetic energy is the energy stored or associated with motion. I'm sorry, kinetic energy is the energy associated with motion. Potential energy is stored energy. Kinetic and potential energy, resting energy, are associated, associated with many different kinds of energy. And there's a list of them here. Chemical energy, electrical, mechanical, nuclear, radiant, thermal, blah, 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 blah. blah. Um, all it's saying is that nearly every form of energy out there has a resting form, okay, a potential form, and then when it's actually doing something or it's kinetic form. Folks, that concludes the first, uh, the first lecture. We will see you next time.